Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so um, let me say uh, hello to Bill and thanks for coming, Bill. So um, I, I should introduce Bill. He's uh, an FT journalist in, in the past. And this is your second book, isn't it, that you're uh, you're selling? To. Copies will be on sale afterwards if you'd like to um, have a stocking filler. And I ought to mention there's a, another talk just before we get on to that, uh, which I should have said a, a couple of minutes ago. We The next Heritage talk is on the 19th when Tim Mole is coming back um, and he's got a book to sell as well. But I don't think you'll get his in the stocking. It's a bit too big for that. Um, on Unbuilt Bath, uh, which if you didn't see it last time round is, and you know Bath, is quite fascinating. Uh, some of the events that uh, some of the uh, projects that could have been built and some that were missed opportunities and some were uh, rather um, rather glad that they weren't built. So uh, that'll be an interesting talk on the 19th. Anyway, for back to tonight and, and Bill, sorry, I started introducing you, an FT journalist, and you, you wrote a book, uh, when did the first one come out? A couple of years ago, was uh, it? Last, yes. Last year. yes, and uh, called Bell Nash, and uh, dutifully encouraged, you've done another one, but you're going to talk tonight about where the boundaries lie between heritage and um, between, yeah, be between fact and fiction when you write historic novels. Um, it's quite difficult writing a novel, isn't it? Because you, you you write a novel and you kind of make it up as you go along, you have a plot and do all that. If you're doing it on a historical basis, you 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 have to, you, you do that, but you also have to check your facts. So it's, it's actually doubly difficult. Well, anyway, Bill, tell us all about it and uh, where you think the boundaries are. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to, uh, thank you, Paul. Um, thank you, uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Thank you very much for coming along and a welcome to everyone at home. Um, I've structured the talk as I structure a book, which is a prologue and some chapters. For the prologue, I'd like to just talk really or getting into the meat, meat of, a, of the actual topic about words, which are a common source clearly for fact and fiction. And also just to define heritage. It's tangible history that we can see. It's the buildings that surround us, the building we are in. It's art, whether it be oil paintings, sculptures or photographs. And the written word, a primary source of history for millennia. And therein lies the issue, perhaps more than other sources, the written word not only shapes our history, but it can misshape it too. As a prologue to the talk, I'd like to discuss language, the capacity to express ourselves through the spoken and the written word. The spoken word, that's something we all do. The written word, as something we can see, that's part of our heritage and want something of a specialty, or as we like to say in English, English speciality. It was once a preserve of a few. Being a scribe was a skilled profession before the printing press came along and Gutenberg and Caxton, these fine looking gentlemen, laid waste to the tribe of scribblers. Bits and pieces survived or hung on and still do. During the campaign to abolish slavery, England had a 20,000 strong black community, mostly men, mostly in London, and a key profession for them, circa 1800, was transcribing musical scores for sale, a big business before the Shellac record was created in 1901. For myself, I recall in 1991 in Lagos, when with the Financial Times, seeing street children reading books printed on an old photostatic press or possibly a mimeograph, which on closer inspection were poorly traced black and white copies of Tintin books. The work of that transcriber was much appreciated. The children loved them. Back in the day, people who could read and write, whether it was music or words, were respected. And those who composed, well, that's an interesting word, to compose music, to constitute, make up, build. 
one also composes poetry. So the word applies to the written word as well as to music. And this sense, that of the writer being a skilled laborer, is evident in other words used to describe members of a profession. A playwright, a cousin to the shipwright, perhaps. A wordsmith, a sibling to the blacksmith. All of which is a way of saying that as a novelist, I have tools. In the same way that a blacksmith has a hammer and tongs, I have alliteration, <clears throat> excuse me, and punctuation to hand, both in the service of rhythm, for prose has a rhythm too, stressed and unstressed syllables, the meter of a passage of text. Again, note the use of words that can also denote a physical measurement and a physical feature, meter and passage to describe writing. As a novelist, I measure, I construct, which is true. I've learned not to start on a novel until I've envisaged its structure, thus avoiding the literary equivalent of a sprawling urban mass. The structure, in simple terms, the length of a book, parts of a book, number of chapters, length of a chapter, use of prologues and epilogues. And that structure serves a dual purpose, to carry the plot line, but also the emotional arc on which the story's characters are led. So not just what happens to the characters, the plot, but what the characters feel. King Charles I had his head cut off. End of, oh, wrong one, end of story. But what did it feel like for him as he waited to have his head removed? As he went to that final walk with his dog in St. James's Park that misty morning? And then, and this is crucial to the organic process of writing, how do those feelings inform subsequent events? One of my tools as a writer, and this is where I get onto the topic of the talk, is history. For the past 10 years, I've written mostly, though not exclusively, historical novels set in Bath, the Gay Street Chronicles series, by which I mean stories based well before my or any of our lifetimes, that's the history heritage bit, but through which I seek to shine a light on our current social mores, that's the satire, which is an interesting exercise as a writer, because not only am I take, taking directly from my own life experiences, melting them down and remolding them, but I'm also imagining the experiences of others, way back when, long since dead, those whose names and life stories form part of our heritage, and I'm pushing them through the same remolding process. Chapter one, reading history as you write. I started writing the Gay Street Chronicles in March 2014, two have been published, a series that follows the misadventures of Bell Nash, grandson of Bo Nash, Bath's most famous master of ceremonies, and this is Gaia Champion, the first Lady Magistrate of Bath, appointed in 1831, 88 years before women were permitted by men to occupy posts of public authority. The first two novels in the series have been published. Another three are written in draft and await for suffering reader. A five book series then, which is known as a pentalogy from Greek pen to five and logia discourse. Why five? The number five is often seen as having a mystical significance. The Torah has five books. The 12th century epic poem, Panj Ganj, written by the Muslim poet Nizami Ganjavi, was in five parts. The 16th century poet Faizi, poet laureate to the Mughal Emperor Akbar, attempted a similar work, but he copped it after completing only two. Shakespeare wrote his plays in five acts, even when the plot didn't deserve it. Hopefully the Gay Street Chronicles will justify five. Time will tell, by which time all will be history. As you might sense, I do and I do not take history seriously. I put historical notes at the end of chapters, either to provide context or simply to entertain. <clears throat> 
An example would be this. I decided a minor character, Ernest Camshaft, chairman of Bath Corporation, should have a dog, and I then wondered what to call the creature. I remembered from my childhood a German shepherd dog called Rommel. I decided Ernest should have a Labrador, named after a British general, but with, only, with the only Labrador I knew being particularly dim-witted, I decided I wanted a famously poor British general. So I researched really bad British generals, 1820. And up popped Brigadier General Charles McCarthy, who was appointed governor of the Gold Coast, current Ghana, in 1821. On occasion, the King of the Ashanti, a tribe in central Ghana, sent his soldiers to attack British forts further south. McCarthy wrote, though they, the Ashanti, have been blustering and threatening our forts without any just cause, they were not prepared for war. The idiot general decided to teach the Ashanti king a lesson and commanded a 500 strong column to take on an army of 10,000 Ashanti warriors who, he soon discovered, were very much prepared for war. Rather than wait for reinforcements, a further 12,000 men were on their way, McCarthy commanded his company's band to play the British national anthem and then engaged. The Battle of Nurse and Mancow did not go well for the British. Not only were they outnumbered, but unexpectedly their ammunition ran out after it was found that the reserve kegs of gunpowder were filled with macaroni. Only 20 on the British side survived. These did not include McCarthy, who was killed, his skull later used as a drinking cup by Ashanti rulers. Such events, of course, though strangely comic in our interpretation of their retelling, are actually tragic. As I do much of my research as I write, character has need of a dog, dog requires a name, a form of coffee, oh my God, macaroni. My writing takes me on a voyage of discovery. Another example occurred in creating a backstory for the character Gerhard Kant, fictional nephew to the philosopher Immanuel Kant in the first book, Bell Nash and the Bath Souffle. I decided it would be apposite for Bell, Nash and Gerhardt, both men are gay, to first meet in the gardens of Sansushi Palace in Potsdam, being the pleasure gardens of Emperor Frederick the Great. It's a magnificent place if you go to Berlin, well worth visiting. <laughs> as a gay man myself, I thought how wonderful for there to have been an emperor who was as openly queer as Frederick. Until that is, I delved into his history. At the age of 18, the then prince had an affair with a Prussian officer eight years his senior, Hans Hermann von Katt. The two men prepared to elope to England, but were arrested and accused of treason. Frederick's father condemned both men to death and forced his son to watch his lover's beheading. A traumatised Frederick was then given a royal pardon as if, thank you, Dad, that made everything OK. Maybe it did, although not for Hermann von Katt. Whilst in prison, Frederick had formed an attachment with a fellow prisoner who would stay by his side as his valet with an adjoining bedroom for the next 27 years. Historians widely regard Frederick as having been a capable, effective, and enlightened leader, possibly the greatest monarch in German history. So how does one pick and choose elements of history in constructing a fictional narrative? How truthful should an author be given, firstly, the truth is often either largely unknown or open to subjective interpretation? And secondly, as a novelist, I deal in fiction. There are two main characters in the Gay Street Chronicles, Chancellor Bell Nash and his close friend, Mrs. Gaia Champion. I started the series simply by feeling the urge to write and the opening pages are almost unchanged from the moment I put finger to keyboard. Apart that is from the names, Bell Nash was originally William Dalrymple and Gaia Champion was Jocelyn Fulbright, 
amongst the minor characters, Lady Passmore stayed Lady Passmore, Mrs. Marigold has become Mrs. Pomeroy, and Miss Pettifer is now Miss Prim. Names matter in a number of ways to a novelist. They root for characters in a writer's imagination as he or she writes. Only after writing the first few thousand words did I begin to research my story. I decided to set the Chronicles in the 1830s. I'll explain more of why later. But it seemed to me impossible to explore Georgian Bath without reference to Beau Nash, who died in 1762. Beau wasn't gay, but being an unapologetic dandy, he is, to an observer's eyes, as camp as a row of tents. Maybe he swung both ways. He never married, and his mistress had a name which might well star in RuPaul's Drag Race, Juliana Popjoy. So distressed was she when their relationship ended, but she spent her final years living in a tree. How much fun might I have, I thought, turning William Dalrymple into a descendant of Beau Nash? Hell's Bells, we aren't aware of Beau having any children, but we don't know that he didn't. Given that I had chosen 1796 for my own protagonist's birth, Bell, this would likely make him Beau's great-grandson. As for the name, I could exchange Dalrymple for Nash and William for Bello, short for Bellissimo, an Italian equivalent of Beau. As regards his close friend, originally named Jocelyn Fulbright, I had in mind her being Lady Magistrate, only to discover that there were no women magistrates until 1919. A bit of a blow, but I could turn that to my advantage and build a plot about how a woman became magistrate ahead of her time. I began to research 19th century women of a similar bent, highly intelligent, career-minded and feminist. The lady who seemed to fit the bill best was Margaret Haig Thomas, who in 1918 became Lady Rhonda. She was born a little late for my purposes in 1883, but in every other aspect, she was perfect. A suffragette, a single-minded woman who became a leading businesswoman of her era. As it happened, a bisexual, although that was not a characteristic I adopted. I and mean, when I listened to a radio programme on Radio 4's Women's Hour, which included an archive recording of Lady Rhonda, and all I heard was the, was the voice of my character. Her middle name, Haig, also intrigued me. It's decidedly masculine, and I thought I could use it to my advantage. If I called my character Haig, Haig Thomas, then that, for a convoluted case of mistaken gender identity, could be the basis on which she is appointed magistrate before her time. The great-grandmother of suffragette Lady Rhonda could meet the great-grandson of Dandy Beau Nash. A friendship made in heaven. 1831 would be a fulcrum year between two equidistant eras. I wrote the first three books in the series using Bello and Haig as my characters' names until I searched out a publisher and found that editors like to impose themselves on authors. My editor, Stephen Gaines, is excellent. Not that we never have our disagreements. I get irritated by the changes he makes, even when they're justified, and he gets understandably miffed by my real life ill humor. His opening gambit was that I needed to change the names for most of my characters, including Bello and Haig. Not by much in the case of Bello, for whom he preferred the name Bell. Because it's more effeminate, I queried, really? Partly, he admitted, but it's also short for Belopheran, the slayer of a chimera. It's very mean of, of Stephen to have chosen a name which I struggled to pronounce. It's a nice classical touch, and I, he said, and I'd like Bell to reference Greek and Roman gods when he talks with friends. Reluctantly, I agreed, swayed by his greater knowledge of ancient history. As for Haig Thomas, he said, it simply won't do. Margaret Haig Thomas was named Haig in honor of her mother's surname. It couldn't possibly have been her great grandmother's Christian name. Well, maybe not, I said, but in the cause of fiction, no, it simply won't do, he insisted. 
But for the purpose of a plot, I reminded Stephen, I need a name that can be mistaken for that of a man. I'd thought of calling her Jocelyn, but that's my mother's name. I don't want to annoy my mother, even though she's dead. It took about a week of toing and throwing before we settled on a new surname, Champion, and a new Christian name, Gaia, which, being Mother Earth, is decidedly feminine, unless you drop the final syllable. There were changes to other characters too. In this instance, my efforts to remain loyal to history were junked by the editor. I'd spent many an hour in the cemeteries of Smallcombe, Lincoln and elsewhere, looking at gravestones, searching for names of a period or close to it, in order to be authentic. The names were, truth be told, uniformly dull. Stephen, on the other hand, wanted to adopt a Dickensian approach, also used by J.K. Rowling in the Harry Potter books. Out went Edward Wood, a genuinely terrible name, for Obadiah Wood. Terence Porter became Hezekiah Porter. The Clark Jonathan Broughton was reimagined as Lucius Lush. And the result? Matthew Paris of the Times declares, part Dickensian, part modern, was a brilliance in the Gay Street Chronicles. So that's how it's done. How faithful should a novelist be to historical events, including dates? My stance is that one should be as accurate as one can without letting absolute accuracy get in the way of a good story. Equally, a novelist should be always aware of glaring inaccuracy undermining the story one wishes to tell. The Other Berlin Girl by Philippa Gregory attracted criticism for prioritizing narrative drama over historical accuracy Although it should be said that the criticism tended to come from historians, many of whom were best known for their turgid prose. Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code has been similarly criticised, which raises the question of why historians have spent their time reading Dan Brown. And sacrificing historical accuracy for narrative appeal is almost as old as history itself. So Walter Scott did it in Ivanhoe. And I might be an outlier here, but I've never been completely sold on the historical accuracy of the Old Testament. I wanted the Gay Street Chronicles to be set in the 1830s and for one of my characters, Gaia Champion, to be a widow with her husband Hercules having died of cholera. The cholera outbreak of that decade was in 1832, and the book opens with Gaia ending her 12 month period of mourning which should place the action, therefore, in 1833. However, another major event in the book's plot is the opening of nearby Royal Victoria Park by then Princess Victoria, which took place in 1830. Ooh. There we go. Well, I brought forward the cholera epidemic by two years and shunted the opening of the park into 1831. In the second volume, the action takes place in a period following the abolition of slavery, which was in 1833. I don't think that's a date that can be messed around with. How about the opening of Bath Spa Railway Station in August 1840? When it comes to the penultimate volume of the series, I may well push that back to 1841. So I do shift dates a tad on occasion. But how about accuracy when it comes to historical figures? The Bishop of Bath and Wells in the mid 1830s was George Henry Law, who I portray in the third volume of the Chronicles as a gourmand cleric in love with his cat. The actual George Law was returned in later years, but that's where any similarity between fictional and historical figure ends. So I've decided to name my character Bishop George Monstrance with its Dickensian flavor. In the second volume, however, I have retained the names of R. Aldrich and Pablo Fancu, a leading stage actor and the foremost circus impresario respectively of their time. Both men were black. I believe that the sentiments they express in the books are sympathetic to their true lives. As for their presence here in Bath, R. Aldrich did perform at the Fiesta Royal and I find it inconceivable for Pablo Fancu 
not to have brought his traveling circus to Bath. By my own admission, however, I have got certain things wrong in the books, which I wish I'd got right. I state inaccurately that Ralph Allen built Sham Castle to improve a view from his drawing room. He didn't. I describe as an oak the tree in Abbey Green. It's a plane tree. In Bell National Bath Circus, Pablo Fancu erects his tent on the lawn of the, of the circus, which would have been challenging given that the plane trees there had already been planted by 1835. I may on occasion have got wrong the name of a street in the period. It's a pity, but there are worse areas. Errors, pardon me. What I cannot abide is inaccuracy in terms of a character's movement. I won't have someone stepping out of Lansdowne Crescent and after a two minute walk entering the Abbey or traversing from the Abbey along George Street to get to Sydney Pleasure Gardens. These are the sorts of things that happen on television along with transplanting of buildings. Bath Central Library and ITV's McDonald and Dodds would be a wonderful addition to our fair city. More interesting is the language of how characters address one another. I make a point of Lady Passmore of Tewkesbury Manor getting in a huff when people don't use her full title of Lady Passmore of Tewkesbury Manor. That's a recurring joke. My characters mostly abide by Jane Austen and refer to even their closest friends as Mr. This and Mrs. or Miss That, but not my two main characters, Ben and Gaia. They refer to themselves by their Christian names, and I do this for a purpose, to suggest to the reader that these are characters with modern social attitudes and social mores. When it comes to accents and colloquialism, I go from a light touch for a Somerset character, such as pie maker Mrs. Crust, I won't be having that in my shop, my lovely I won't, to a far heavier touch, apologies for my Somerset accent, with, say, the Norfolk accent of Pablo Thank You, who was born in Norwich in the second volume. The truth is, of course, that whilst we have some insight into how people spoke 200 years ago, this is largely through the written word, and the written word is only an approximation of a spoken word. Accents and dialects cannot be easily reproduced, and attempts to do so can be distracting. I'm currently reading the wonderful This Thing of Darkness by Harry Thompson, an account of the voyage of Charles Darwin on board the Beagle. One of the officers has a stutter, which I'm sure is historically true, but inevitably it breaks up the rhythm of reading. The same is true when a novelist misspells words, dropping or adding an H, for instance, in an effort to capture a dialect. For this reason, I've mostly kept from modern spelling, modern spelling of words, rather than using, which was a temptation, spelling more common at the time. Here are some examples of words and phrases used by the excellent Tobias Smollett, a humorist and novelist from the mid 18th century. I love Stew Pan of Idleness and Rancor Stale Maidenhood is just an appalling phrase but it's incredibly cutting. Chapter four, what really what went on back then? If we only have a shadowy idea of how people sounded in history, the same is true as to how people fought. I mentioned King Charles I earlier and how he might have felt as the hours counted down to his execution. His view would presumably have been colored by the extent of his belief in his being a divine monarch. In which case, what did God think he was playing at? I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that I enjoy what I consider the idiocies of our ancestors' thinking, <clears throat> just as future generations will look back at us and say they believed that. The richest seems are religious and medical. Did the Catholic Church truly believe the payment of indulgences would provide a free ticket to heaven or not free? As for doctors dispensing oil made from boiled human bones to relieve gout in medieval England, I'm so pleased I've got gout in 2023. I'm not an academic in such matters. My own interest 
is in the history of enlightened thought as a way of highlighting, through my novels, the absurdity of bigotry and intolerance. I'm one of those who believe that the history of philosophy or social thought should be an essential part of a school curriculum. It is one of the ironies of this blessed nation that despite having produced many of the great enlightened thinkers, they are hardly discussed, let alone lauded in this country. For instance, John Locke, a son of 17th century Somerset, is more admired in the United States, his thinking being integral to the founding fathers than he is here in Great Britain. Of course, extolling Locke is fraught with danger. Yes, he believed in tolerance. Why argue, he said, as to who should best represent God on earth when we all believe in the same God? Locke had his limits, though. Jews and Muslims could go to hell, as could Catholics. He was also secretary of a board of trade and plantations and owned stock provided to him as part of his remuneration in slave trading companies. So perhaps he wasn't that tolerant after all. Fast forward a century and a bit, and you get to consider the writings of Jeremy Bentham. His thinking built on that of Locke into a forthright attack on slavery, support for women's rights, and a belief that religion was itself a breeding ground of intolerance. Bentham's writings included a critique of the criminalization of same-sex relations and his support for animal rights. That's quite a move in 100 to 150 years. And whilst Bentham was ahead of his time in some regards, he was not isolated in his opinions. It was in 1772 when an English court ruled that James Somerset, an enslaved African, could not be transported from England against his will. The slave trade from Africa was outlawed by Parliament in 1803, with the Abolition of Slavery Act finally passed in 1833, and the practice of indentured apprenticeship on plantations ending in 1838. This timeline is mirrored in other social movements that I study in the books. Whilst Jane Austen is usually regarded as pre-feminist, Mary Wollstonecroft published her feminist treatise of Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792. It took 200 years for a statue commemorating Britain's first female philosopher to be made. And here we are worrying about how novelists make a hash of history. By the 1840s, the Bronte sisters' pens were hard at work, although it took a further 70 years for the principle of equality between the sexes to be won in Parliament. The campaign for gay rights is commonly regarded as having been sparked by the trial of Oscar Wilde in 1895, but that's not so. Same-sex relations were decriminalized in France in 1791 with the adoption of a penal code in the revolution. This was closely followed by the Napoleonic Code of 1804, which extended decriminalization to most of the countries occupied by France. It strongly influenced other countries, mighty Andorra in 1791, gentle Monaco in 1793, right-minded Luxembourg in 1795, then Belgium in 1810, the Netherlands in 1811, Spain in 1822, along with many German states. This movement to decriminalize same-sex relations in Europe ebbed and flowed, but it began in 1791. Indeed, before that, as changes in the law don't come out of nowhere. So how do I take all of this, the history of social movements, and reflect them within my novels, both as a mirror on the 1830s and also given the book's satirical purpose on today? I'd like to think, and this is my being subjective, that whilst attitudes were different back then, they probably weren't by much. Of course, given limited communications, there was a higher degree of ignorance of what we term social injustice, but again, not in all likelihood by as much as some imagine. You cannot have had society as openly engaged in debate and as divided 
on the issue of slavery without a broad awareness of the issue. It is true that there was domestic propaganda that portrayed an idyllic plantation life. It is true that many of the people who owned slaves never set eyes on them. And no doubt they were church-going Christians to boot. But to what degree is ignorance credible? Consider the church. The Church of England owned slaves in the West Indies and physically branded them as their property. Visit Elmina Castle, a concentration camp and a processing factory for the enslaved at Cape Coast in Ghana, and its central feature, see there on the rise, is a church originally Catholic. The hierarchies of a church, Anglican and Catholic, were not ignorant. More than that, they were active participants. How about secular Britain? Step back into Liverpool of the 18th century, and there were timber merchants and shipbuilders who refused to have anything to do with the slave trade. People knew, they knew. Yes, there was greater ignorance among some, but how many and who? Were women perhaps more ignorant than men? Last month, I visited Exeter and saw in the great cathedral two plaques in memory of Margaret Moe and Catherine Buncombe, who died in 1770 and 1772, respectively. The plaques state they were from the islands of Barbados and St. Christopher's, now known as St. Kitts. These ladies were born to wealthy, plantation-owning, white families, and they had lived in the British West Indies. Both families received compensation from the state for the loss incurred on the people they had enslaved upon abolition in 1833. When Margaret and Catherine came to England, are we to believe that they remained mum about what occurred on the islands of their birth? Did these women not talk, chat and gossip with other women? Whilst it is sometimes said that women of the era did not discuss politics, there's plenty of evidence that they did I'll read you a passage from novelist Tobias Smollett, published in 1771. One of his characters, a young lady called Lydia Melford, writes a letter. Lydia writes, hard by the pump room in Bath is a coffee house for the ladies. But my aunt says young girls are not admitted inasmuch as the conversation turns upon politics, scandal, philosophy, and other subjects above our capacity as young ladies but we are allowed to accompany the older ladies to the booksellers' shops where we read novels, plays, pamphlets, and newspapers. In these offices of intelligence, as my brothers call them, are all the reports of the day. Smollett is suggesting that women, young and old, were attuned to the political and philosophical debates of the day. And if the women knew, then the men, the drivers of bigotry, most certainly did. My conclusion is that there was a fair understanding of what was going on when it came to slavery, but that most people chose not to care. There was greater hypocrisy, greater wealth disparity, and the eternal willingness of moneyed individuals to be led by economic self-interest, and to that end, to embrace racism. On this point, it is important to listen to the account of Dr. Eric Williams, the historian and philosopher who was the first prime minister of independent Trinidad and Tobago. It was his opinion that racism emerged from slavery, not vice versa. Racism was a means of justifying the heinous acts of slavery from which others, including many of the wealthiest in Britain, sought to enrich themselves. Well, times have changed but again, not by as much as we might think. When reimagining history, if you're like me, people tend to project themselves back in time in the same socioeconomic class or higher from whence they came or would aspire to be, moneyed middle to upper class. I certainly do. 
Of course, that's a very, very unlikely place to find yourself in if transported back in time. You and I would be much more likely to end up in the workhouse or as a peasant farmhand or as an enslaved laborer on a plantation rather than a member of a wealthy merchant class. Imagining otherwise is simply a desire to be worthy of and vow. There are other examples of that at play today. We fall into a form of tribalism in an instance to further our self-interest. I expect that most Grizzly members, including myself, being an enlightened crowd, would consider themselves not to be bigots. But being of a certain age, many of us might also oppose the trend of wokeness in society. Those who complain about woke society are often ignorant of the etymology of the term. It's, it is African-American in origin and means to be awake to racial prejudice. I would argue that people who oppose racism, misogyny, homophobia, and other form of bigotry should all consider themselves to be woke. This is not to deny the argument that society should be wary of being led into overly protecting small groups who feel prejudiced against if it's to the detriment of a larger group. It's a thoroughly Benthamite argument. Not that non-Caucasian people are a small group in the UK, nor are women for that matter. But I'll leave that to one side. My point, and it's one I seek to explore in my books, is not who is right and wrong. It's a little more nuanced, nuanced than that. It's how we as individuals perceive to which group we ourselves belong. Again, I don't wish to speak on behalf of others, but I will speak for myself. I'm a privileged gay white guy. I like to imagine myself as Bell Nash, the grandson of Bo. But what if I belonged not, as I wish to imagine, to the wealthiest stratum of white male Bath society, but to those who ranked among the most offended? Take your pick. Women, black people, brown people, yellow people, homosexuals, queers, transgender, whose opinion was and is rarely asked and was and is so easily dismissed. What if that were you? Attitudes were different back then, but whose attitudes are we talking about? I've wandered into the history of ideas and for that, I make no apology. If a history of ideas is an essential part of any country, then it's ours, the UK. Hobbes, Locke, Hume, Wollstonecraft, Bentham, Stuart Mill, the list goes on, and all of them are part of our heritage. Our intellectual heritage, in the same way as Austin, Dickens, or Bronte sisters, Hardy are part of it. Chance of our nation. I'll now take questions, although advanced warning, you'll have a hard time blaming me for mistakes, inaccuracies, or indeed anything you consider outright baloney in my books. As I wrote them, merely abusing to some degree heritage and the cause of fiction, I constructed a, a defense against backstabbing pedants. Like other gay writers in history, namely William Beckford and the finger twirler Horace Walpole, who wrote the Gothic novels Vafek and the Castle of Ontranto respectively, I began the Gay Street Chronicles by disowning it. The stories I purport were left to me by my late uncle, William Keeling Esquire of Gay Street, of whom there is no picture. I publish them in his honour. So if you want to blame me, blame him, and good luck to you. Thank you very much. Do we need to remain in the dark, do you think? Or? Yeah, I'll go and... Um, Dave's putting the lights on. Um, if you've got a question, um, I mean, welcome questions. Uh, can I ask you to speak into the microphone so people on Zoom can hear us as well? Um, and uh, and also for people on Zoom, 
if you'd like a question, if you if you'd put it in the uh, the Q and A box, I I'll, I'll read it out in the room. Um, I think there's a Q and A at the bottom. So I'll and it, or the chat box. Um, so um, anyway, um, is anyone good? All right. Okay. Thanks, David. Do do feel free, free speech encouraged. Make make comments for the questions if you want to. Right, right at the beginning, you said one thing that surprised me a lot. So I want to question you again about it. You said that you plan not only the plot, but the emotional emotional arc progress. Mm. Yeah. I couldn't think of the word yes. of your characters. And surely as you're writing, you would find out more about the characters as you develop the plot and the emotional arc would be different than you thought. I mean, the characters mm. develop a bit. I, I just find that very hard to believe. That you plan the emotional arc. Could you? Yes, elaborate? It, it's 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 a, a fair, very fair question to ask. So I tend to uh, write in plot books uh, by imagining the ending, the denouement first, and the ending can be, you know, an event, something explodes or someone dies, whatever it is. Um, but it's also the emotional state a character's left in, or the emotional state of relationship between two characters. And I then decide how I'm going to get there in terms of a plot. So I actually tend to work backwards in constructing a plot. As uh, an example of that, I, I have written five of these books. I started writing them 10 years ago as a way of, I think, keeping me sane, um, of combating melancholy in large part. Uh, but I'd envisaged them as, as, a, as a trilogy. And being a backward-minded sort of person, I came up with the ending of the third book first. And so I actually wrote the third book, the end of a trilogy, first. And I did that for two reasons. One, as I've explained, I tend to work backwards from a denouement. And in a trilogy, the final denouement is of a third book. Um, the second reason was so that I could um, meet and learn about the characters myself before I then went about the task of introducing them to readership in the first book, as it were, in Belle National Bar Souffle. So I, I deliberately wrote them out of order. So by the time I wrote Belle Nash and Navarre Souffle, I had got to know the characters and therefore I could imagine the nature of their emotional relationships because I'd already plotted uh, the next um, eight years of their lives, as it were. Um, so it, absolutely fair. And you're right, that, that obviously things change as you write. Um, and I try and write in a very... Uh, organic manner. So a writer like P.G. Woodhouse, if you read a Blanding's Castle novel or um, Jeeves and Worcester, um, it's absolutely amongst my very favourite books. One of the things which don't occur in P.G. Woodhouse is there's no existential threat. It, it's Aunt Clarice is probably the biggest threat of all, wherever the aunt is, is named. And I wanted to write in a way, would house and dramas, but with existential threat thrown in there. And so I, in a way, that, that's what I've partly set out to do. Um, and I try and take caricatures both of both genders, um, but the haughty lady and her put-upon companion, the... Um, troubled spinster who knits constantly. These are all caricatures out of English literature and English film. And then I actually try and put some emotions into them. Um, and so uh, I, when I write, I, Woodhouse, 
wrote, his novels are, are about 80,000 words a pop. He wrote synopses of them of about 25 to 30,000 words before he wrote the full novel. Um, I'm far too lazy for that. It was certainly not my style. I write a two, 300 word idea of what a chapter is going to be. And then I write it, and sometimes I find that I've never actually got to the point of what I'd intended to do by the time I finish a chapter. Other times I find that I've completed the purpose of the chapter in the first paragraph, and I know I've still got three and a half thousand words to go. So I have to go off on, uh, not on a tangent, and that can lead you to different emotional points, and then those have to be encompassed. But it's important to keep, at some point, pulling yourself back onto the, the, the arc you've imagined. I would say, because otherwise you get out of control of it. Yeah. So you mentioned slavery yes. in your talk. Yes. And I was just wondering how you thought uh, you were making the points you wish to make about slavery, which was certainly so prominent at the mm -hmm. time that you've chosen to write about. So I my, my own background is... Um, I, when I was with the Financial Times, I lived in West Africa for three years, uh, in Ghana and and uh, Nigeria, and so my perception of uh, a lot of race issues are uh, coloured, no no pun intended, by the my time there. Um, I see um, humour as being a defense against bigotry by oppressed groups. In the same way that as a gay person, we use frivolity as a tool against oppression. And if you're gonna be nasty to us, we'll just laugh at you. And it's possible therefore to, certainly in terms of the medium of satire, to use comedy even when you're examining issues of say racism, because you're looking at the absurdity of it. You're making fun of the absurdity of it, the idiocy. There is no economic or cultural gain to be had through racism or misogyny or homophobia. You're simply putting down and belittling important groups who could add to the general economic welfare of society. Uh, and to the enjoyment of society, there is no purpose. So I, the plot I constructed is incredibly important. It's very difficult to write about racism as a white person. I have to be very, very sensitive to that. And the biggest mistake I could make would be to set up my hero as a white savior. And my hero desires to be a white savior and simply falls down at every juncture because it's not possible. It's not possible. So the, the heroes in the second book uh, are not white people, uh, to put it mildly, because uh, white people are at the core of the absurdity of racism or at the core of the intolerance of the time. So that's how I've tried to manage it. Um, I Clearly, I, I spent, I normally write a book in a, in, a, in, a, in about a year, and that book took me about four years to write because I was very fearful of getting it wrong. I hope that I haven't. I've shared it with um, a lot of black friends and um, they've all given it the thumbs up, which I think is them being truthful rather than them playing a joke on me. But anyway, we'll see. Yeah, it's tough. It's, it's a very, but then as a writer, I wanted to be challenged by that. I specifically wanted to look at that issue because, again, if you're going to write about history, you can't write about the 1830s and not talk about the abolition of slavery. You know, if I'm going to start using history and talking about social issues of intolerance, I can't then not discuss racism. I can't just, oh, I've forgotten that the abolition of slavery took place. So that's absolutely at the heart of the issues I wish to discuss. And what I try and do in the books is to make people laugh, but also feel slightly uneasy about their laughter at the same time, because the underlying issues are important. Um, so the women are fighting for um, some entitlement, but some of the women are just so hopeless, they just don't get why they're doing this. 
and others who are sort of fighting for it find her being tripped up by their friends and they're ahead of their time. They're just, nothing's gaining traction. And again, that, the sort of slipping and sliding and trying to get social progress and the, the slow pace of it, which means you're failing to get it in many ways, is again, in a, in a strange sense, at the core of a comedy I try and portray. Can I, can I ask a question? Please. Um, you obviously think some facts, dates or whatever, are not to be messed with, mm. and others are a bit malleable. Where do you feel you draw the line? Is it sort of large acts of parliament or, or, or what? And then you go to the, the, the trouble of trying to have an authentic name for somebody's Labrador named after yes. a, a, a dodgy general. Yes, who yes, exists. who existed. Um, it is a hotspot, to be perfectly honest. I, I would feel pretty comfortable in shifting around most dates by a few years. Um, but I think something when, when it relates to the strands of bigotry I'm investigating, so slavery, um, in the, I write, when, in the historical notes I put at the end of each chapter, most chapters, again, I put some in mostly for sort of entertainment. So a reference to King Fred, Frederick is just at the end of a chapter, it's not within the storyline. But there's no point in lying about a date or you don't need to, to play around with a date or the historical facts at the end of a chapter. And that's quite useful to be as, uh, to be honest and, and, and factual in most cases. Um, I don't... I, I, yeah, I don't otherwise try and mess around too much. So shift a little bit, but uh, I don't think most things historical aren't, you know, aren't that sacrosanct in my mind. But um, but when it comes to the key dates of the timeline of bigotry, of the different strands of bigotry, then I think it's best to be as honest as possible. Thank you. All right. Um, we've we've got actually we've got one uh, comment on the on the uh, on the on Zoom. It says, and, and you've got a fan, Bill. What do you? <laughs> um, what what to? Um, what, uh, oh, hang on, sorry, I'm reading the wrong one. There's, there's an earlier one. I'll read the second one in a second. Bill, thank you for the evening. Um, your writing experience and approach seems uncannily close to my own, which is very reassuring. I'd be pleased to discuss with this, this with you on Radio Bath, and I'll give you the, oh. the address there. So yeah. that, that's a, a follow-up. And then there's another one here, which is, um, what do you want people mostly to get from your books? enjoyment with all that means of the story or understand appreciate and think about the points you're making about the aspects of life okay it goes or a mixture it stops there at a mixture but i think that's the question what what do you want people to get from so, so I, I i think that um i i like being able to read books through different prisms and um it's quite <clears throat> interesting when one say goes back to a book, I remember reading Secret Agents as a schoolboy, and um, and it was all about espionage and spies and anarchism. And when I reread it about ten years ago, I thought that what Conrad was doing was actually um, doing a critique of um, how society abused the position of women and the infirm uh, within the society. The anarchist is, um, is retarded and the wife, the mother of the anarchist is someone who is horribly exploited in the book. And I just read that through a different lens, as it were. Um, and Clearly, that's more typically done when we go and see plays because the director is doing it for us. But I, I have tried to write so that one can read the books either through the lens of pure enjoyment, a sort of Woodhousian uh, romp, or where you can begin to pick up on the themes which I do look at and examine, 
and see them as maybe slightly more uh, intellectual, sat intelligent satires. Um, and hopefully there's another layer down. What I would say is that when I discuss the books, I tend to talk about issues relatively seriously. And I tend to be um, you know, offering a critique on society now and then. When it comes to writing, uh, I, I, I have a lighter touch. Um, I've tried to write serious books, so I, if I try and write seriously, I just end up um, putting in jokes or being frivolous or being flippant or being facetious or being fatuous or great F words, which my mother tended to accuse me of being. Um, all of that does come out in my writing um, as in a whimsical way, I hope. So you can look at it both ways. So you mentioned Mary Wollstonecraft. Yes. Who uh, came to Bath, of course. Uh, I wonder if you discovered more information about her time in Bath or that wasn't? I, you know, I haven't and I should do. Um, so, and I, I'd, I'd, have, I'd happily do that because I do uh, try, I'm, I'm not an academic and as a novelist, I do a certain amount of research when I want to get on with it. And then I've learned to do a lot of my research as I'm writing as well. Uh, so I, I, and I do research around the plot. And so I, I have read up about Mary Wollstonecraft, but I, I'd forgotten actually that she spent time in Bath, this is the honest truth. I know Mary Shelley did because there's a museum here, isn't there, which has popped up. And uh, obviously Mary was, was, was her mother. Um, I was more struck by um, Mary Wollstonecraft's uh, mental problems and um, her attempted history of attempted suicide and ultimately her extremely tragic death. Um, and it was, I mean, what a remarkable woman and what a terrible loss that she died so young. Uh, clearly, um, I hopefully we're going to hear about more about her in a talk possibly next year, uh, which we which we must all attend. I certainly would wish to. Well, I, I mentioned earlier, Betty, that you've got a talk coming up in oh, months. So. There you go. <laughs> um, so no, I would I should I would love to know more about her, and I, I apologise for the slightly facetious slide earlier on, but I thought that was a terrible statue which was made. Mary Shelley came here, you know. There's some thought that Mary Shelley came here because her mother had come here. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, we have another question here. Um, could you speak to the impact that novelization, is there a word novelization? Okay. But anyway, but say novelization of historical fact um, has on making people understand the truth. So, in other words, how does um, a novel? convey history to people and, and 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 does it leave them with an accurate impression or, uh, or or not? I first of all I love the word globalization I think that's an excellent word. Um, I suppose if one were to take a, a particular instance, say our perception of workhouses, then we would all see workhouses through the writings of Charles Dickens um, and whether those portrayals are accurate, I suspect they were because Dickens did do his research and visited uh, these hell holes. Then um, it is thanks to his novels that we have uh, the type of emotive understanding of workhouses that we do. Um, having said which, you know, workhouses were created actually with the best of intentions to try and get. Uh, people into a place of security um, and to manage the the funding of them accordingly. So um, I'm not going to take another instance of novelization in us in that way, but the same history of the decline of workhouses into shabby hell holes from what was broadly, I understand, a reasonable intention was the same with, with um, mental asylums, uh, as they were called, or houses of bedlam before that, where they were built with very much the best intentions um, to house in relatively modest numbers, 
be insane. And then because the houses of Bedlam were funded by the national government, I believe, and the poor payments were being handed out by local government, local government officials encouraged the poor that they were insane and pushed them into houses of Bedlam to push them onto the budget of the state. The houses of Bedlam then got overwhelmed massively and became one flew over the cuckoo's nest equivalent hell holes. So there hasn't, in, in, and in those sorts of instances, I think that's where really history, you need to read your history in order to get a sense of what the timeline was and what the cause of effect was. Whereas novel, novels tend to be very specific in the moment, not all of them. Obviously you've got war and peace and others, which sort of you know cover far greater spans of time. But most novels would just be about the specific moment. So you're in a hellhole rather than the period of time um, of change. Do, which... do, you, do you think that um, someone who's read your books would end up with a reasonable, reasonably accurate impression of how Bath was in 1830, say? Um, possibly not, but I think it would make them inquisitive to go and read up about it. Um, they're, they're clearly, um, you know, if you're sat satirizing things, it's inevitably not a particularly accurate impression. I don't really study the full um, demographic population of Bath, by which I mean I don't really talk much about the servant class, um, nor do I talk about um, where the servant class comes from, which would have been a, a global diaspora or dominion, diaspora from the dominions. And so that, in some ways, I, I am guilty in my writing of, uh, white, of whitewashing to a degree, even though the second book uh, looks at racism and has two significant black characters in history. And Miss Prim's cook is, uh, is South Asian, Mrs. Mulligatawney, which isn't actually the real name, but everyone called her Mrs. Mulligatawney because they couldn't pronounce her long Sri Lankan name. So I, I would stand guilty as a humorist and as a satirist of not being wholly accurate, uh, but I do think I've put enough in there in order to make people's lines of inquiry open up, would be my defence. Okay. Do we have any more questions? I'll just check, I think. Uh, Can uh, I ask another one? Please Did you pick your period first? and then start storytelling from there? Or did you have a story to tell and found that was the best period to place? It, I, I think I chose, I've, I've thought about why I chose the period. It's two things come to mind. One was that from the age of 13 to 18 for my O levels and my A levels, I studied history and only studied 19th century history. And I hated 19th century history with a passion. Absolutely, I thought it was the most boring period of history. And in many ways it is. Not a lot goes on from the end of the Napoleonic Wars through to the Crimean Wars, um, in terms of you know blood and guts and stuff. There's an awful lot of social change, awful lot of industrial change. But to a, to a young kid, I wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to study you know, the Tudors and the Stuarts and that lot, and never did. But it did mean that it was a period I knew quite a lot about already. I wanted the books to be set in Bath. It didn't have to be, but I thought it was a good place to set them in, given the role Bath played in um, wealthy society in the UK at the time, and the fact that the drivers of bigotry really were the wealthy people, uh, in my opinion, discussed. And I chose the 18 verses, first of all, because there are elements of the social movements which have come into play there. If you start trying to write about feminism pre-Mary Wollstonecraft, pre the vindication of the rights of women, 
was not a necessarily an awful lot to say. Now, clearly there was still a discussion, because she didn't write the books out of nothing, but there wasn't a lot to say. The 1830s with the abolition of slavery is a lot more interesting, because that's where the argument really comes to a head. The discussion on race within this nation was far more live and virulent and contested in its argument than, say, the Black Lives Matter debate is now, which is important today, but nothing like it was then. And then I discovered this gay rights movement. The other reason for choosing, well, so two other reasons for choosing age, whether you ask the question, I'll give you lots of answers. One is that it's a fin de siècle period. And I think by nature, there's this sort of emotional richness of an era coming to an end, particularly when the people themselves aren't aware that it's coming to an end. But the rest of us do know because we know our history. The final point is, is one of language deployed in the book. It's quite easy to write a novel where one uses at least some of the mannerisms employed by Jane Austen and everyone goes, that's Georgian England. If one goes back to the mid 18th century and you go back to Tobias Smollett, who I referenced, the language is, is he's an absolutely brilliant writer. He's in fact incredibly accessible to read, an absolute joy to read. But the language is more um, is more mannered, even more mannered, and a little bit more sort of fractured. And the spellings are much, uh, you know, are, are more convoluted. If one wants to be honest, so it's just easier to uh, to reference a period in writing in the eighteen thirties than it would be in the seventeen fifties, let alone earlier than that. Thank you. Can I ask another question? When you, when you write, um, it's very easy to be sympathetic to the your, your, the characters you're writing about, but often they have characters uh, characteristics that you would disapprove of, or perhaps um, you you wouldn't uh, wish to be associated with. Do you find that you're too sympathetic with all your characters, or do, are you able to? sort of really get into someone's head if they're behaving in a way that you'd really disapprove of? I, I would be slightly guilty in terms of, again, caricatures of having good, good and bad characters. But the good characters tend to be flawed and terrible things happen to all the characters, whether they're good or bad. Um, so the good characters get tripped up and deposited into slurry heaps effectively than as much as the bad characters. Um, I think where I make things more layered and nuanced is in fact in the relationships between, say, the good characters. The good characters are broadly speaking a collection of friends, uh, four ladies, there's Guy Champion, there's Lady Passmore, there's Mrs. Pomeroy, Miss Trim, and they fall foul of each other's moods and temperaments in the books and whilst giving something completely away by the fourth in the fourth book lady passmore has her her diamonds stolen which is a terrible shock to the old dame and she she um she has a stroke and ends up in a bath chair at which point the power dynamic between lady passmore and mrs pomeroy is reversed um for a period of a book and that's a very interesting thing to have done. I enjoyed doing that, where you take two characters, one of whom has always put the other one down. And then, of course, what happens in real life, you suffer a stroke and suddenly you're there going, ah! <laughs> the person you put down all your life, and you're suddenly realising they're one, 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 the person who's going to feed you for the next um, uh, six months or years. So I, I hopefully have achieved some nuance in that. Um, I... Myself, I'm not particularly sympathetic to any of the characters. Um, and in the final book of a series, hopefully it will get published in, in a few years' time. The social issue I look at is the is drug addiction and the opioid crisis. And I do that too because it's ongoing now. It's very real within the gay community with what are called chems, uh, which are a collection of extremely nasty extremely nasty drugs. Um, and it was completely prevalent in the late well, 1840 with laudanum. 
And there was a huge problem with laudanum addiction, um, both obviously in China, because we were selling the stuff to China in order to get our tea and porcelain and silk over here. We were growing the stuff in India and shipping it to China. But a good amount of opium was turned into laudanum and consumed here. Oh, not a good amount, a huge amount. Um, you know, tens of thousands of little files were sold every weekend for people to get high. Um, at the epicenter of this was Norfolk, where apparently people were particularly keen on laudanum. Um, but it would have been happening in Bath big time as well. So all, a lot of my characters get hooked on laudanum in the fifth book. And I don't, you don't do that sympathetically. <laughs> yeah okay right well um actually you're in good company um but i i had a look before this evening and uh hilary mantel is actually um uh, i mean her books are very highly thought of but she apparently moved uh, tweaked the events a little bit just to fit the plot so uh, okay. you're in good company there and uh i remember a while ago, I went to a talk by P.G. James. I mean, she's not, not around anymore, but she was talking about her books and uh, someone asked her about the mistakes she'd made in her books. And she said, well, in one book, I did have a motorbike reversing down a lane. So, you know, these things happen. So, anyway, um, thanks, Bill. It was a very Pleasure. nice, uh, very good talk. And uh, I'm sure we learned a lot and sort of understand far more about what goes into um, sort of trying to tread that careful line between fact and fiction so thank you very much thank you much thank you everyone